Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Tamara Beckford Show. Yes, I'm Dr. Tamara Beckford. I am an ER physician. I help organizations to reduce their employee burnout through self-care workshops. But in my spare time, I am the host of the Dr. Tamara Beckford Show, where I have all my amazing physician colleagues stop by and tell you all the amazing things that they're doing inside and outside of clinical medicine, right? So I know you're there and you're like, wow, I'm going to really love this episode. And I'm like, yes, you will, especially if you're a physician. We're talking about the favorite part of your day. This is the part that you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I cannot wait to do this. Yes, we're talking about charting. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness, you're going to love it. So I have my wonderful colleague here. Now, if you are really busy because you are charting at the moment, but you want to go back and hear this wonderful episode, do not hesitate to go to our yourcaringdocs.com, select podcast. You'll see my lovely colleague's face and you just click that link and listen. If you are a physician and you're like, you know what? I got amazing things and I want to let people know about this too. Hey, I welcome you here. I welcome you. Send me an email at drbeckford at yourcaringdocs.com to book. Do keep in mind, we are booked out at least three months in advance because there's so many amazing physicians out there. You guys are all amazing. So don't get discouraged. Just time it, you know, send me the link and then we'll get you on. Right. All righty. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our wonderful colleagues. And if you are one of our physicians, you can start charting on this, right? Okay, so our doctor here today, he's a graduate of the University of Illinois, Chicago. He did his residency in um, university or Indiana University, pardon me. Indiana University. He is a pediatrician. So shout out Mm -hmm. to Indiana University. Yay. Shout out to all my pediatricians at the house. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. And he is currently working in Indianapolis. Yes. Funny listening and charting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like Dr. Necka. Yes, you are charting (laughs) as we're listening. I love it. He is the CEO of MedEdWell, where he helps our physicians finish charting faster so that they can get home sooner and do what matters most. Absolutely. He is also the host of the MedEdWell podcast. I'm talking about the one and only Dr. Ryan Stedjig. Go, go, go. <laughs> Let's see those charting fingers, Dr. Ryan. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, I mean, what can we say? This is the most famous part of the Physician's Day, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you so much, Dr. Beckford, for having me here on the show. And I'm so excited to make charting more exciting. Um, (laughs) Although, really, it's like you said, it's, it's a so that. It's doing this so that you can take great care of patients and get home for what matters most to you. Absolutely. So before we start charting all of that part, let's go on to the other uncharted territories. Am I going to keep talking and using charting little memes and jokes? Maybe. I'll just say whatever comes to mind. But let's start it off by telling us when and how old were you when you decided, you know what, I want to be a doctor. Tell us a little bit about that part of the story. Absolutely. So when I was in high school, Mm -hmm. I had a family friend who was a teacher and she saw something in me and said, Mm -hmm. someday you're going to be a pediatrician. Really? Yeah. She did. She just went straight to peds. Yeah. So she had seen me volunteering with children before Mm -hmm. and knew that I was a hardworking student who liked science and math. But she saw something in me that I didn't quite see at that point. I had Great. volunteered in the hospital a little bit, but mm-hmm. I actually ended up going to undergrad for physics and did a pre- <laughs> pre-med emphasis. And so oh. it was uh, kind of meandered that way, charting my path through. Mm-hmm. And I got it. <laughs> I like the corny dad jokes and uh, the puns and so mm-hmm. my daughters will one day just shake their head. That's, that, hey, they'll shake their heads with my son shaking their head. But yeah. I, I love the fact that like someone saw this in you and mm-hmm. then they said, you know what? You're going to be a great pediatrician. Like I said, they didn't even give you like the doctor option. <laughs> They're like, nah, you're really good right here. 
Interestingly, I loved how you went into undergrad for physics with a sprinkle of uh, the pre-med major. So what was going through your mind? You're like, I might want to do this, but then I might want to be a doctor. So what was it that went through your mind at, in undergrad? Because you didn't go straight into pre-med. You went to physics. Mm -hmm. So... so <laughs> Yeah, okay. it's kind of an interesting thing because you think, oh, it's like, was should I have been a biology major or a chemistry major? But no, I had a really good teacher in high school mm -hmm. and I was just really curious about how the world works. And so a lot of the initial physics classes are more about classical mechanics, how things move, forces, Newton's laws, and not so much on the quantum mechanics, which mm -hmm. when I got there in undergrad, I was taking that at the same time as organic <laughs> chemistry, which was quite the load. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so fortunately, I had a really good organic chemistry teacher whose teaching style, he would just write on the chalkboard all of the equations and draw it out. And so we were expected. He didn't have PowerPoint notes. And so you didn't get the slides. You had to take the notes yourself. But that really worked with my kinesthetic learning style. Mm -hmm. And I started to lean more towards medicine. Wow, that is interesting. Now, if anyone is in undergrad right now and you're doing physics and organic chemistry at the same time, we salute you. <laughs> we understand your plight. Wow, that is that's amazing. So you went in there using, and it really goes to show, like I say very, very, very often here, you know, our teachers those who are leaders in our community, someone who has paved the way, when you're doing the work and you have someone who is a child watching you, the impact is immeasurable. You know, you talk about that teacher that you had this really great physics teacher. Remind you, someone says you're going to be a great pediatrician. You went in and you had such a great impact from your physics teacher that you went in as a physics major, mm -hmm. you know? And then someone else saw something great in you, and that probably sprinkled that maybe I can also add that pre-med on the side. So that's a great impact. Now, we have some people, like we said, that are saying hello. So let's give you a chance to say, say hi, Dr. Neka Ichoku. She said, funny enough, she is actually listening and charting. <laughs> She's listening to you. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get some great skills from it so we can you're not charting at home that we can, you know, leave all the charting at the, where it should be right at the job. And then we also have, um, Maraf Hussein that's saying, hello, hello. And that, you know, say, welcome Dr. Ryan to the show. Thank you so much, everyone. Alrighty. So now, you know, you're in undergrad, <clears throat> you did your sprinkle of pre-med, but then you went all the way, you went into med school. Now, when you went into med school, there are a lot of people that's been introduced to medicine. They said, yeah, I'm going to be a this. And then they left at that. <laughs> so when you went into med school, did you go in thinking, yes, I'm going to do peds? That's it. So I thought I might do pediatrics. And the first two years, you have someone that you go shadow maybe once a month and work mm -hmm. with them. And so I actually was matched with a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. But when I got to my third year, I was trying on all the different specialties, at least the core competency ones. Mm -hmm. And everything was just really fascinating to me. And I was kind of between pediatrics, medicine and pediatrics, combined training and family medicine. Mm. But then I had a mentor who was actually MedPeds trained only practicing as a pediatric hospitalist. And he told me, he said, you need to pick the patient population that you are really passionate about. Don't use specialty choice as a means of saying, well, I'll do med peds and then I'll decide later. It's mm -hmm. like, you need to figure out what you want and then take that next step forward. And that's how you made it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Again, the power of mentorship, you know, in helping you to choose. And so you can really bring a little bit of balance to the life that you're trying to live. Mm -hmm. Because as we say, and you know, this happens to all of us, we're scattered in our 20s. We're like, I like this, I like that. You know, I'm good at this. So maybe I should do that just because I'm good at this. But mm -hmm. as your mentor said, what population do you want to work with? So that requires you to sit and reflect and really mm -hmm. think within and, you know, 
You're, and so do you remember the day when you came up with that thought that, you know what, it's peds. It's everybody else saw it in you, but you know how it is. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to see it in yourself. Do you remember that day? I can't remember that day specifically, but mm -hmm. by the time I finished my pediatrics rotation, I had a pretty strong feeling that this was what I was going to do. Did you get peds first? What What was the order in your rotation with no, the pediatrics? So I actually started with internal medicine, um, and it was good that I had some experience doing some paper charting. They still were doing paper charting. This was back probably 2011, 2012 mm -hmm. at this particular hospital. And so it was good perspective as I went through my career. It's like, okay, what does paper charting look like? What does uh, different systems look like? But then I didn't get to pediatrics until probably my fourth or fifth rotation in probably February of my third year. Ah. Ah. So so at that point, you'd experienced all the others. And so you knew that after that rotation, yes, this is it. Yeah, I think I may have still had surgery to go, but mm -hmm. I didn't, I knew that I probably wasn't cut out to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for all the great surgeons out there, but that Absolutely. just wasn't, wasn't my thing. So yeah. I was just really I thankful to find a good fit because so many, and this is why it's so important to have those speaking into your life, whether it's mentors in the community or mentors in medicine, because I didn't get to see a number of other specialties until midway through my fourth year when I'm already interviewing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having that exposure to what I ended up really loving, I was really thankful for. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So pediatrician or the pediatric rotation was my first rotation. Mm. Scared the bejesus out of me, <laughs> as with my, you know, and, and now I do emergency medicine where I, when I get my peds, my well sick peds, for those of you, my, you know, the well sick, the ones who are like, oh, you know, you give them Tylenol and then they perk up and you're like, yes, mm -hmm. I'm fine. So those, those pediatric patients, I love them. When I was doing my peds rotation, I was scared of them. <laughs> so, so I love that you had peds near the end where you said, oh, yes, you know, it has solidified in you, especially mm -hmm. after getting all the um, info and the mentorship, choose what population you want. And you decided, all right, this is it. Now, interestingly so, you mentioned the paper charting. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Checking those boxes, writing the, the entire thing out, your history of present illness, what made it come in? These beautiful, and you said it, especially internal medicine, we salute all my internal medicine docs and, you know, these very long, long written notes. Mm -hmm. So we went from that until now electronic charting. When did you start to notice that, whoa, this charting is really adding a burden to life and it's really affected my life. When did you start noticing that? So I don't think I really started to notice it until probably mm -hmm. midway through residency. Mm -hmm. I remember as a, as a med student, we were told you have to write out your uh, histories, your mm -hmm. history and physical, you have to write them out kind of from scratch. So you do them on the computer, but you have to write them all out, which mm -hmm. at the time I thought, well, why can't I just use a template? It really... <laughs> It really did help solidify in my mind what is supposed to go into this. Mm -hmm. But then I realized as I went through some of the different computer systems, the computer system was trying to replicate the paper chart in the computer, and yet it meant there was a lot of clicking. And so they said, oh, you could choose any of these physical exam findings, but then you had to click, click, click. click. And it just started to add up. And so... Death yeah, it's a thousand clicks. <laughs> absolutely. So, so you started to notice that when is it that it came to mind? Like, wow, I can like this is bothering me. I figured this out. When did you start to figure it out that you're like, you know what? I can help somebody else with this. When mm -hmm. would you say that this clicked? Oh, did you get it? When did it click? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it, it froze on my brain for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so I would say that at what point <laughs> did it click that yeah. you have figured it out on your in yourself, you know, mm -hmm. how to navigate these charting issues so that you can help others to do the same? 
So it really kind of took probably through my first year of being an attending and mm -hmm. I graduated. I ended up in the same continuity clinic that I was in throughout residency, but we actually transitioned uh, medical records right about the time I took my boards. And so that was a big change. And I was just bringing more and more stuff home because going from seeing maybe six or seven patients in a clinic session once a week to seeing eight to 12, um, nine sessions a week, mm -hmm. it was a big thing. And so I was charting at home on the weekends, early in the mornings, and I just wasn't able to recharge. Mm -hmm. And so I had some interest in how do we use the new system? How do we get things to populate and work better together? But when I was burned out, I had the opportunity to cut back a little bit and to be able to go away to a training on how to actually build things in our medical record. So mm -hmm. it really just allowed me to get a deeper understanding and mm -hmm. then to be able to share some of those tips that I learned um, that anyone could use. It wasn't just for the building side. So it oh. really helped. Interesting. You, you know, you mentioned the transition um, in the workload, how it went from, I wouldn't say manageable. It went from one level to the explosive level. Mm -hmm. And then you also mentioned at that point, you started to see that you're charting, like your free hour in the day was all like at least a great portion of it was dedicating to charting, charting, mm -hmm. charting, charting, charting. And this led to burnout. For you, what did the burnout look like in you, Dr. Ryan? So for me, burnout looked like I was irritable. Mm -hmm. I was tired. I was bringing everything home and just, I also speak Spanish. And so between speaking in a different language mm -hmm. and using interpreters and having the same 15 minute slot for every patient, regardless of what they're coming in with, whether yes. you're going to <laughs> deal with all these different things. I just, at the time, I really found that to be stressful and overwhelming. I think that's an understatement. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that is an understatement. Ooh. I mean, I, I also use interpreter machines at um, work, you know, mm -hmm. as an ER doc. And with the, the three, and, you know, I trained where we trained to use the interpreter before mm -hmm. the, the physical machines were there. And we know that that adds at least it doubles that time period mm -hmm. in ensuring that the information is conveyed, that you answer all the uh, questions for the family, that they feel comfortable, especially mm -hmm. when you're counseling, you know, so to really cram that into a 15 minute session that is similar to with just speaking the native language of wherever you mm -hmm. are. Yeah, that's I can see how that'll make you feel as if you're not doing as well of a job, because if we yeah. think about what burnout does to we talk about the irritability, we thought about like, you know, the fatigue. But then there's this part, too, where you as a provider start feeling like I am not able to give as great mm -hmm. of, um, you know, like I normally would, mm -hmm. you know, in these circumstances. So now you also notice that you paired some of this with. I have to bring home all of this load, document everything. And then, so I, at this point, as you mentioned, you got an opportunity to step back, which is what a lot of people need to do during that portion. But then you got an um, opportunity to learn how to build a system and add your input so that it's a little bit um, palatable for those who are using it and then you're now using those techniques so what would you say are like three top things that you from a charting standpoint that you're like hey did you know that this can help you to reduce this so three things that people are like oh my gosh you know what dr ryan dr ryan for president thank you so much <laughs> let, let us know three things <laughs> So my top three things would be number one, um, working on uh, standardizing some of your templates. Mm -hmm. And so if you are able to make templates say for a different disease process, or for me, it's more of the age-based well visits. Mm -hmm. And 
it's it'll be an iterative work in progress kind of like the quality improvement thing but mm -hmm. just knowing what's there and if you ask one of your if it's a super user or someone who has a little bit of informatics training it might even it might not be a, one of your colleagues it might be someone that works for your institution mm -hmm. but being able to build those out and to take that time to say how can i invest up front and it might be 30 minutes or an hour so that you don't have to click as many things so that even if there is a little bit of note bloat because you brought some of these things in if it's essentially you building somewhere where you can see what their last creatinine was what mm -hmm. their last lead level in the children was those can really save you some time so Absolutely. first the templates mm -hmm. number two you want to try and optimize your preference list so you might have the ability to say favorite some orders mm -hmm. and you want to say how many things can you click in advance so that maybe you can bundle you always do this set of labs for a patient who comes in and uh, having trouble with diabetes uh, dka mm -hmm. um, it could be some other thing or a particular set of instructions that you give to everybody or that you want to make sure that you document the same way that when that patient comes in that child who's fine but has a fever it's like you gave them their tylenol their temperature came down you gave them some fluids you documented their heart rate and you told them these are the typical return precautions mm -hmm. so it could be preferenceless those can kind of go into the templates as well as far as the documentation mm -hmm. but from the orders it just cuts down on the clicks and sometimes mm -hmm. the back and forth between your keyboard and your mouse oh. <laughs> it's like going back and forth you just feel like wait where am i mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely and then already so we've talked about having some template sets, mm -hmm. templates for common things that you're usually doing. Hey, you know, my patients are coming in for this particular disease process. Mm -hmm. I know that these are questions that I usually ask and these are orders. Like the second one is bundling a set of orders. Like mm -hmm. they're common orders if they're coming in and they're DKA and that's diabetic ketoacidosis for those who are not um, in the medical field. So that one is one of those really big emergencies for someone with diabetes, especially if they're insulin dependent. So, you know, the diabetic ketoacidosis, there are a list of medications that are given, fluids, labs, and monitoring that occurs in that. So you're just bundling that because um, if we're if one were to to put those orders in individually, it can end up being over thirty five click ins or more, plus type in just for that one patient if you are doing just individualized orders as i th i'm thinking about it because i mean mm -hmm. i take care of these patients in the er <laughs> so i'm thinking like if they were in a bundle i can see how you know that's a lot of clicking individually that that um things so now we're charting we've taken care of these patients like say for example me as an er doc oh my god I finished taking care of my DKA patient. I got them to the ICU. They're doing well. Now I got a chart on them. What are some mm -hmm. ideas that you would have for me to reduce my charting so that I can go home and mm -hmm. be with my two sons? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and this is what took me the longest to go from as a resident and a mm -hmm. student of having these amazing notes that I spent, <laughs> and they're a masterpiece. And so yes. I'm used In the to Hall get, of Fame, right? Absolutely. It's like, if you want to get honors, you need to have an amazing note. It's like, however, really, it's about learning. Like, and this is something that comes with experience mm -hmm. and asking others and observing. But it's like, what do you need to absolutely have in there? And what is eh, that's nice, or that could make it more flowery language, but you mm -hmm. can make it succinct and sufficient. And as notes are increasingly transparent to patients, appropriate and clear but at the same time you don't need to have all of that extra stuff that maybe i would have put in as a fourth year med student mm -hmm. so you're saying that i'm not trying to get the shakespearean award from my notes 
typically no. <laughs> and there are sometimes dictation devices and software that can help with that. Mm -hmm. However, it's really important to then go back and make sure that it's accurate and reflects what you meant, um, even when you have maybe a scribe at your um, disposal, which Absolutely. many of us, myself in primary care uh, included, do not. So you are correct with the dictation device. That's one way to really cut down on it. However, for those who are not in medicine and, you know, when we use a dictation device, let's just think about it similarly when you're using Siri and you're asking Siri to give you <laughs> and Siri gave, gives you a word that is not the word that you asked for that occurs during the use of yes. some of the dictation devices so i used to use it and i was initially very excited but for those same reasons mm -hmm. i no longer use it mm -hmm. i think the biggest thing and honestly this is one takeaway that anyone at any stage of training can really take is mm -hmm. figuring out how you are able to get something charted in the room while you're in the room and so if it's just what they specifically said about their disease process, what they said the patient told them before they're now less responsive, mm -hmm. having anything in the room or any pertinent physical findings that you're able to click or add, those can really help kind of jog your memory to say these were the abnormals. And mm -hmm. so having something can then allow you to get it done more quickly later um, Absolutely. without saying, oops, uh, it was generally normal. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. So one way to really reduce, like we said, some people use dictation devices, templates are great. Um, writing down and trying to elicit the information or at least putting some of the pertinent information while you're in the room is good. Most important though, is to move away from the mindset of trying to win the Shakespearean award in the best written notes, because it's just what is the most important information at that time. Yeah. And then we have to remember what were the points of our notes in the first place. I know a lot of times, I know now notes are, you know, like we said, they're available to patients and so on. But the core of the note is to communicate with the next physician and to leave the information for yourself so you can remember the next time. Mm -hmm. So however you can document that information, so whomever you pass that note on to, they open their note, they are able to understand what happened. And it's usually the physician. So the notes, I mean, this might go out and if you know the powers that be are offended, I mean, I, I'm I'm sorry, but the notes are for physicians to communicate with physicians so we can take excellent care of the patients. So the patients have access to the notes. That's wonderful. But the notes are for physicians to communicate with each other Absolutely. so that we can take excellent care of you. So that's what it is, right? That's Absolutely. <laughs> and it's and ultimately, that's the part where you really get to show it's like your thought process, your differential Absolutely. diagnosis. And so the thing that I always scan to is what's the assessment and plan? Mm -hmm. What were you worried about? What else were you thinking? And especially in a day when it's all about access and mm -hmm. less about continuity because people will call and even though they might see me, they might be offered a, an appointment that's two days sooner with another doctor Absolutely. or provider because it's, just available and that's how the system's set up. And so if I'm able to document not only my thought process mm -hmm. succinctly and appropriately, but if there's something that I want them to come back for in a month and it, I can put that next step, if this fails, then we'll try such and such other thing. Mm -hmm. When appropriate, it can really help streamline and make sure that people are getting the appropriate care because notes are supposed to be about patient care. Yes. Absolutely. The notes are about the patient's care so that whomever is reading it, like you said, they know what the next step is and what the thought process of the, I guess we'll put it author of the notes since I think that's how they have it in there. What is the, the person who originated the note, the provider, actually the physician who's um, 
writing that note, they're conveying that information to the next person who's reading that note. So like we said, it doesn't have to be Shakespearean, just clear, succinct, your thought process, your next steps, and what are some of the things that you're worried about? Mm -hmm. There we go. That's it. So it can be bullet point. <laughs> mm -hmm. It could be numbered one, two, three, four. It um, does not necessarily have to be thesis and MLA format, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All righty. So now that we've really talked about that, I'm going to bring it over a little bit to you personally and see, you know, we talked about just a little bit about, you know, you went through the process of burnout and, you know, you're taking home all these charts and you're charting before you went to work, you're charting after work, you're charting on the weekends, you know, and that leads to a level of just really just you're, you're empty, you're worn out. So now in order to prevent that, what are some of the things that you're doing personally to prevent heading towards burnout again? Tell us. So for me, a few of the big things are, first I have to know my why. Mm -hmm. And so having the priorities for me, it's faith, family, and um, being able to connect with friends. Mm -hmm. um, and so starting from there, then you're able to say, okay, well, I really need to at least 90% of the time be done with my stuff at work. So mm -hmm. paperwork, notes, and other things. And then working back from, I think it was Stephen Covey, that begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, say, where do I want to be? And so build backwards to say, what am I going to have to do to make that happen? Absolutely. It might be that I give up my ideal of Shakespearean notes. It may be that I give up um, the idea that I have to have every single chart closed before I leave. It mm -hmm. might be that I do some of those when I come in the next morning, but I prioritize those that I know are sick and might have had to go to the ER overnight. Mm -hmm. And so that way, when you're seeing them at three in the morning, you actually know what I saw 12 hours earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I, and, and, you know, like you're saying, someone in the comment too, they're saying, I love it. Know your why. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming you read Simon Sinek's book. Uh, not yet. Start with your why. Begin with the end in mind. Yes. So Simon Sinek is, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's one of his um, famous book, um, like, you know, knowing your why. And mm. uh, so it really... And I think for anyone who's building something, anyone who you're at that point in life, understanding your why, like you said, brings you out of what are some of the main things that I need to do to achieve this goal that I have put up as my why. And when we say your why, like, what is it that's important to me? You said faith, family, and, you know, being able to connect with friends. So that's, mm -hmm. those are your whys. So when you are at work and your mind says, you know what, Ryan, we don't have to chart right now. Maybe we can go and start chit chatting, go over to the water cooler and, you know, start just chit chatting at the water cooler. Your main why comes into mind. If mm -hmm. I spend 30 minutes chit chatting at the water cooler and you say working backwards, right? So mm -hmm. what's gonna? What are the results of that? Well, I'm not gonna be able to finish these important charts. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to take them home, and when I take them home, that's taken away from my why. You know, mm -hmm. that's taken away from the fellowship, the connection, and now that's taking sleep, and now mm -hmm. I'm stressed out at work. I mean, at home, thinking yeah. bringing work. So we see how working backwards from that, and just really focusing on some of the whys that you can. I wouldn't say force, you can guide yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, it gives a certain amount of like constraint to say it's like, okay, it's like I'm doing this now so that I can do this later. And if I really sit down and focus and mm -hmm. it sometimes you get interrupted and it's appropriate, sometimes it's finding those ways to batch it and to say, I'm going to do my notes maybe in this unused patient room mm -hmm. for 15 minutes and I get more done there than I might have in a half an hour if I was getting a reasonable but non-urgent uh, refill request or paperwork to sign mm -hmm. and talking to my colleague for another 10 of those minutes. Um, Absolutely. So it really just is figuring out what 
you, yeah, what your why is and why that matters. So for me, it's like my daughter watching the window for, is daddy home? And then she'll be like, she's two and a half, uh, mm -hmm. I have two daughters, one's an infant, so not quite there yet. But <laughs> the two-year-old will be like, daddy's home. And then, I mean, if I don't get my stuff done and then I'm a half hour later, it's like she's already eating and getting ready, ready for bed. For bed. So mm -hmm. being able to get home most of the time for dinner is huge in terms of you just have to play out what will that look like when I actually follow through on this. Absolutely. That would motivate anyone. That feeling mm -hmm. of getting home. Because you're you're when you get home, you're like a superstar. Dad mm -hmm. is up. Yes. I mean, <laughs> that'll bring anyone to to try. And that's and that mm -hmm. I think when it, when we really sit and think about what some of the reasons why a lot of people enter into the burnout villa is that you know I'm doing all of this work and and I don't get to enjoy the little things such mm -hmm. as getting home to get the hug you know getting home just to to see my child the look in their face they're smiling you know it's challenging when I leave and they're sleeping I come home and they're sleeping and on the weekends I'm working so much that I have to keep telling them I'm I'll be there soon I can't do it right now I can't do it now all of that weighs upon you so it's really so even though we're talking about charting it's more than just charting it's like, you know, it's really working into your life. So it's kind of you taking control so that you can live the life you want, so that you can have that time. You know, go ahead. What were you thinking, Dr. Yeah, Ryan? so I think that point about being able to take back some of that control, there's so many things that these days we just don't have that control as physicians anymore. Mm -hmm. And so being able to say, these are some of the things that I am able to control. And even as I got into coaching and had experienced it before I did my training, just the power of, I can choose to have a different thought. It it may not be the, I mean, that unintentional thought, like that, just like, oh, this is stressful. It's like, yeah, charting just is, mm -hmm. but my experience of it is because of thoughts I'm having. And they may be well, well rehearsed thoughts that I've had so many times that it's, it's difficult, but I can still do that to say, it's like, no, I can do this. Yes. I can make it home for my family. I can make it to dinner plans with uh, friends an hour after clinic is supposed to be done and it should be reasonable. So it's yes. not just family, but it's like, what do you want to be able to, do you want to be able to go to a concert or a movie? Mm -hmm. um, it can look like any number of things. So that's why it's knowing your why. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's that's an important portion that I consider an important portion of self care. Understanding mm. what's important to you, it's individualized. You know what's important to me might not be the same layer of um, you know things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. Love it. Alrighty, so you know. Before we go into, I know you have a wonderful program coming up, and we're going to talk all about this. But before we go into it, I have to ask my fun question of the day. So, Dr. Ryan, <laughs> if you weren't a doctor, what would you be? Well, normally I would say probably something where I could be getting into either systems and computers, like in events. I mean, I grew up playing soccer and I was a goalkeeper. And mm -hmm. so this month I would probably say like uh, a, a professional player. professional soccer player. I but, love it, World Cup so, it is. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's probably where I'd go today for the fun. Today, a professional, yeah. you're actually my first professional soccer player. I love yeah. it. We have a lot of dancers, we have, you know, travel photographers, we have restauranteurs, we have cafe owners, mm -hmm. urban planners, florists, interior designers. And by the way, these are all doctors, guys. Mm -hmm. So these are what goes through it. But now we have a, a famous, because you're not going to just be, you're going to be a famous soccer player. I uh -huh. love it. So I'm going to add that to my list. So we do have some highs 
you know, there we do have Mama Trisha saying hi. We have some LinkedIn users that are agreeing. They like, yes, they love that. Know your why and begin with the end in mind. And we also have Greg Lyon saying hello all the way from Australia. That was my famous Australian accent, Greg. You tell me how I did. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All righty. So, Dr. Ryan, we have a wonderful, you are also the host of the Med Edwell podcast, but you have some wonderful programs that's coming up next month. So we are in December and in January of 2023, you have a wonderful program coming up. Tell the audience, what program do you have for those who want to know and do better at charting? Thanks so much. So I am leading a program called Charting Mastery, Ooh. and it's to get home sooner with your charting done. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, it's about knowing your why, and it's so that, it's not just so that you can say, I'm a Shakespearean charting master. It's mm -hmm. having your charting done so you can get home sooner for what matters most to you. Mm -hmm. And I initially had kind of put this together as both a course and a coaching kind of package together. Mm -hmm. However, I realized that kind of lowering the bar for entry may mm -hmm. be really helpful for people that are like, I don't know about this coaching thing, mm -hmm. about working with my mindset, but I do want to get my charting done faster. Mm -hmm. And so kind of splitting those out so that those who are ready for coaching, I'm, I'm here for you, come join me. But if you are like, hey, I want to do a program with some CME credits, and be able to make steps forward so that I can get home sooner, then this is the opportunity to join me. I love it. So when is this opened? Because we are at the, this recording is December 1st. All righty. Um, you know, we said this is in January, so I need to mm -hmm. gear up and be ready for this. So let me know, when is this program going to be available? Yeah, so I'm going to have some webinars the first week of January, January 4th and 5th. Okay. And then I'll have the card open from January 9th, Monday through Thursday, the 12th. And we'll get started on the 18th. Love it. Love it. So we'll ease you into it, have some mastery, master classes, mm -hmm. and then we're bringing you in. And then we're getting this party started so we can get you home so mm -hmm. that fill in the blanks so that you can spend more time with your family so that you can go to that concert so that you can have that family member so that you can go on that vacation quickly so that you can have peace of mind mm -hmm. fill in the blank with all of that i love it love it love it so now we do have you know let's talk a little bit before we head on out oh it was perfect thank you so much greg <laughs> he says my accent was perfect <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the Med Edwell podcast before we head on out. Absolutely. So I started the Med Edwell podcast as a means of uh, providing education around wellness and medicine. Mm -hmm. That's the name. But it really was kind of born out of me giving some lectures to residents, um, mm -hmm. the residency I was a part of, and realizing I wanted to share my experience with burnout and with grief and just going through a lot in my early career. Mm -hmm. and to be able to share that on a broader level and to really be able to encourage people in mm -hmm. taking that next step whether it's knowing your why about financial things that i didn't know as a resident mm -hmm. yeah. and to be able to move forward and to live a, a fulfilled life in medicine absolutely absolutely i love it so for those of you guys out there we have the med edwell podcast we have the one and only dr ryan stijek but before we go dr ryan someone in our facebook left a wonderful wonderful comment and this is what they said and i, I would be remiss if i did not let you know what they're saying mm. they said this is a great conversation for someone like me who has add I feel we burn out a bit quicker. The mm. concept of working backwards sounds foreign to me because my whole life, I felt like a hamster on a wheel, mm. spinning wheels forward, but never really meeting goals. I never really thought about the why. It is important to me versus the why. This is, this is being asked of me. Mm. Wow. The why that's important to me versus the why that's being asked of me. Mm -hmm. So 
because I it just says Facebook user, so I'll have to come in and comment afterwards. But thank you so much mm. for putting out your experience. And as you can see, you know, this is why our physicians out here who are doing these amazing things, like Dr. Ryan, this is why he does what he does to help you to achieve that goal. I'm telling you, for anyone who has ever been in a position where as our Facebook user, you're just feeling like you're on a hamster wheel and, you know, you feel like you're just spinning along, but you're getting nowhere. You know, like Dr. Ryan says, he has opened up his program. He has two parts to it and one part incorporates coaching. So for those who have never experienced the power of coaching, open your mind take a step in. Once you step into that realm, you now you understand why those of us who have been coached are just so honored and why we have moved to a level where we have found peace. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a very powerful tool to use in adjunct to whatever else you're going your experience in life and all the goals that you want to accomplish. It is a powerful tool. So for those of you guys there who are thinking, you know, I am not sure if I want to add the coaching part of Dr. Ryan's program, do it and do it for you, do it for you so that you can experience the why and that you can achieve the why and that you can change the way we think about the processes in our day-to-day -day life and the way that we go about achieving those goals. Trust mm. me, it's very powerful. Ah, what are we saying? Yes, so Greg is saying conscious reflection is where the mm. true value lies. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thank those of you guys who are in the chat. Thank you, Mama Trishan. Thank you, Marav. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Neka. Thank you to our Facebook user. Thank, thank you for um, Greg, all the way from mm -hmm. Australia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. But Dr. Ryan, do you have anything do you wanted to add? Yeah, I think that conscious reflection is really kind of part of coaching and just giving individuals an opportunity to bring some of those thoughts to the surface mm -hmm. so that you can actually say, oh, well, that's actually what I'm thinking and how I didn't realize that was causing these effects downstream because we're, this is a group of smart, intelligent, wonderful people that mm -hmm. by just having the neutral person there to process with as a coach, mm -hmm. then you're able to say, it's like, oh, maybe I do want to change this or mm -hmm. maybe I want to keep this and this actually does impact my why and I want to double down on that. Mm -hmm. And so I can't make you change or do anything it's it's not even about that it's about saying how can you bring that to awareness that conscious reflection mm -hmm. and so um and yeah just whether however your brain works best to be able to break it down mm -hmm. and so you have the end but you have all these little steps you don't have to choose it all at once yeah. because that leads to the overwhelm and mm -hmm. so rather than saying, I can't do this, or I can't be like this other person in my practice that gets all their charts done. I remember hearing that early on in my career where one of my colleagues was like, oh yeah, I'm pretty much done with all my notes by the end of the day. And I was just like, what, mm -hmm. who, who are you? And saying, it's like, okay, these little steps and just yes. breaking it down so that you focus on one thing. It's like, I will do one template today mm -hmm. and that is it and that's okay. And just to give yourself space to do that, I think Absolutely. is really important in terms of self-care and self-love and self-compassion. Absolutely, which is all gonna benefit you. And if you are built up, trust me, the community and all of your whys, you're doing this for family, mm -hmm. you're there, so you can do this for family. I'm doing this for community. You're gonna be there, so you can do it for community because you've been filled and you've, you have filled at your cup. And I think um, Dr. Tawana says, she says that we're going from for the saucer ministry. She said, mm. so whatever has spilled over onto the saucer, 
mm. you're able to give that because you have filled your cup. This was a mm. wonderful, wonderful conversation, Dr. Ryan. Thank you so much for stopping by and letting those know, hey, mm. you can do this too. One step at a time with the charting process. Like we said, we don't do overwhelm. Mm -hmm. We just give you, you know, you provide the tools in a neutral way mm -hmm. so that the person can choose how they proceed and all of this, they focus on your initial why so that you can live that life that you're dreaming of. I love it, love it. Now, for those of you guys who were watching, and I know that you're gonna love this, so go ahead. You're like, oh, you know, I didn't get to hear all of it. That's okay, that's okay, we got this, we got this. It is gonna be available on your caringdocs.com. Just select podcast and see Dr. Ryan's face and just click listen here. For those of you who have an Apple device, we would love if you leave us those wonderful five-star reviews that we love. And we have, you know, some of you doctors out there here like, you know what? I have those great things that I want to tell someone else about too. That's really going to help them. Hey, we welcome you. So go ahead and send us an email at drbeckford at yourcaringdocs.com. That's Dr. B-E-C-K-F as in Frank, O-R-D at yourcaringdocs.com. And just say, hey, I want a book. And we will send you that link. Do keep in mind, we are booked out three months in advance because you guys are so awesome. You guys are awesome sauce. So just like, you know, Dr. Ryan has this wonderful, wonderful program that is coming up in January. So he wants to tell you all about it here in December. So you have time. So think of those dates, January 4th and 5th, then 9 to the 12th. And then mm -hmm. he's starting promptly on the 18th. So go ahead mm -hmm. and get those things ready, right? So if you do have a program and you want someone to know about it to do, keep in mind, you know, we are booked out three months in advance. So go ahead and send us that email. We would love, love, love to have you on the show. So any parting words, Dr. Ryan, before we say adieu to all those who are watching? I'd say thank you so much for, for having me and just take that moment to slow down, mm -hmm. even if it's taking an hour to go somewhere quiet so that you can actually hear yourself thinking mm -hmm. so that you can know your why and to be able to plan and then execute on your first step towards that. Love it, love it, love it. Yes, wonderful words. Take that time mm -hmm. to yourself so you can slow down, find your why and execute towards it. Alrighty. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.